Awesome. Let's pray. Let's quickly pray. Lord, thank you again for this morning, God. Thank you for your presence with us. Now, I pray right now, God, would you open our eyes to see something that we need to see today? God, open our ears to hear something we need to hear today, Father. And Lord, just speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Father, that when we leave this place, God, we don't walk out the same as what we were when we walked in. God, that we would walk out, uh, God, more convinced of our faith, God, more committed in our hearts and our lives to you. And God, uh, more aware of the plans and purposes of God for our life in the time that you have given us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, look, if you are visiting here today and it's the first time you've come here, firstly, it's great to have you. Really, really glad you came and you're, you're spending a morning with us. But my disclaimer after that is, why couldn't you have done it another Sunday when we weren't talking about finances and giving and money and so on? So if you're one of those people that you've not come to church for three years because you've said to, or some, that you know, all the church wants is your money, right? And you've sat back for three years and you've not walked in the doors of a church and then you just plugged up the courage today and said, I'm going to go to that church up there. I'm going to walk in there. And you've sat down and I don't want you to go, I knew it, and never come back. We don't talk a lot about, we, we pastored a, a, a previous church assistant pastors many years back and at that church we did a, they did a giving talk every Sunday, every Sunday morning somebody would stand up and now I don't have a problem with that. Um, there is a lot, J Jesus spoke a lot about material wealth and finances and the management and so on. Last week we looked at Luke 16 where Jesus actually said, if I can't trust you with worldly wealth, how can I give you true riches? So there's a connection between the way that we manage uh, what, what Jesus called the least of riches, which is worldly wealth. He said, if we can't manage that, how will we ever be trusted with true riches? And so I, I, I'm a big believer that in my life, I want to go after the true riches. I mean, I want to go after the big picture. Uh, my, my, money is, not my, money is, is a form of provision. It's not my provider. Okay, the, 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 the material stuff that I get, it's, it's a form of provision, but it is not my provider. Okay, my God shall provide all my needs, amen? It's my God that provides my needs. And I've been in situations where if, if my provider was my provision, I would have been in all sorts of trouble. Uh, I got saved, I came to faith at 19 years of age. And six months after that, I'd just come to faith. Six months later, the Lord spoke to me. I felt like the Holy Spirit told me uh, he wanted me to go and do some training with an organization called Youth with a Mission. Anyone ever heard of YWAM? I, I went off to do some training with YWAM. Now, when I became a believer, uh, I was working. Uh, I, actually, I don't even know if I had a job at the time. I was pumping gas at a petrol station, that's right, and running uh, errands so that the guy would let me use the, the, his, the vehicle to deliver food. And then after that, I could drive it around and do whatever I wanted between deliveries. Um, and then when I got saved, became a Christian, I got a job at Sunny Brand Chickens in Byron Bay. Anyone remember Sunny Brand Chickens in Byron Bay? Yep, I was an advanced prepared chicken handler. That was my official title. I walked in there. They gave me the contract. Do you want to be an advanced prepared chicken lander? I thought, whoa, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Sign on the line. And I spent the next period of time cutting bones out of dead chooks. That's all I did. It just sounded a lot more fancy than it actually was. But um, God called me and said, I want you to go and do this thing called YWAM. And of course, back in those days, it's probably more expensive now. It was $1,800 to go and do a training school with this organization. And I didn't have any money. And I wasn't earning a lot of money. And what I was earning, I was putting back into uh, uh, places where I had spent more money than I had had before. So I was paying off these debts that I'd got myself into before I came to faith. And there just wasn't a lot left over. And I knew at one point, this isn't going to happen. I can't go uh, to this organisation because they want the money. Show me the money. Because, of course, they've got to pay for things too. They've got to feed the students and put a roof over their head and pay for different speakers and, and keep the power on and the electricity. They've got all their stuff that we all have too. Every organisation, churches have the same things. We've got to pay for the lights and the air cons and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, I'm, I remember going, God, I, I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't have the money. And all of a sudden, in the mail, I get this uh, 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 letter from a guy called Kiwi. Any Kiwis in, in the house? Any New Zealanders? Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'd only just met this guy and we connected over rugby union. We both love rugby union. I'd only sort of had one day and chatted a few hours and he, he was in Sydney and somehow he sends me a letter going, 
somehow I found out that you're going off to this, this, that you became a Christian and that you're going to this thing. Hey, I felt like God spoke to me to actually pay for your fees and there was an $1,800 check in. I'd never seen $1,800 in my life. I was tempted to get on a plane and go overseas and live for the rest of my life. <laughs> Do a runner. Open an account in the Bahamas. I didn't, I'd never seen that amount of money ever and I'm holding this check, you know, sweating. Oh, God, what do I do? Do I really go through with this? I could do a lot with that, God. <laughs> Buy another car, whatever. Anyway, I went to YWAM. I'm in YWAM three months in the lecture phase. And then at the end of three months, you do a 12-week outreach. And uh, while we were, were praying about the different outreach destinations, the Lord spoke to me. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go to Indonesia uh, and Malaysia for your outreach. And, and town, went to Townsville for two weeks. Then we flew over to Indonesia and, and uh, Malaysia. And, of course, you need money for that. Air tickets, they don't... We didn't have a travel agent that just gave us air tickets. I wish we did. But they said, well, we'll give it to you, but you have to give us this thing called money first. And so, again, here I am the day before. We're going into the uh, travel agent that day after the last... After this lecture this day, we're walking out onto the bus and we're going to pay the travel agent. If you didn't have your money by then, then you heard from... You didn't hear properly from God. You're not going an outreach. You can stay on the base and get involved in just mowing lawns and whatever it is until everyone comes back. But I was resigned. I thought, okay, no worries. I've got no money and, and so on. So I'll, I'll be... You know, if that's what you want, God, I don't really care what I'm doing for you, Lord. You saved me. I just want to do whatever you want me to do. So if I've got to stay here, I'll stay here. The last lecture finishes, we walk back into the, 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 the big hall and there was all these little pigeonholes in the wall which were letterboxes for everybody. And I walked in and I walked past my letterbox and I looked and there was an envelope in there. And I pulled out the envelope and I opened it up. And in the envelope is a letter from a lady that I knew. She was in Ballina. She was going to this little uniting church I started going to when I became a believer. And so I, I barely had anything to do with her as well. But in a, a very series of unfortunate events, her marriage fell apart. She ended up moving down to uh, South Australia, spent some time down there in Bible college and so on. Anyway, her house that her and her husband had the house sold. And when the house sold, she felt like the Lord said to her, I want you to give uh, X amount of dollars to uh, each of your children, natural biological children. And then he said to her, and I want you to give X amount of dollars to Alan because he's my child. And so I walk in that day and I pull out this envelope and there's this letter and I'm thinking, oh, that's amazing. And then I, I, I pull out, go back into the envelope, pull out a check. It was to the cent. Remember when we, there used to be cents? Things used to be worth like something and 32 cents. Remember those days? Or 41 cents, remember that? Now it's all fives and tens, yeah? Uh, well, this was back when it was twos, and it was something like, you know, $1,243.82. It was a weird, obscure amount. The check was exactly that. I could not believe it. I just could not believe it. So I'm glad that early in my journey with God, God taught me this. He is my ultimate provider, no matter where he calls me. No matter what I do, no matter what my, my, my vocation at the time may be, and I've had different vocations and we've been in different countries and different places, my provider is, is, is God. God is the ultimate source of my provision. And, 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 and until, we get that, when, until we get that revelation, we, we tend to live a life of worry, don't we? We, we, we live a life of worry where we feel like we've got to take care of ourselves. Matter of fact, we, we feel like orphans. We, we live lives like we're orphans. It's all about me and I've got to make everything happen. But Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send my spirit. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to be here with you. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 to 26, and we looked at this passage last week out of Luke, but I want to just make a connection here out of Matthew. Matthew 6, 24 to 26, uh, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. And that word masters is the Greek word kyrios, which in most other places is translated as... Lord, was anyone listening to me last week or not? <laughs> hey? Lord, it's translated Lord. Lord, Lord. Why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? It's the same word. For some reason, it's translated as masters here, but it's the same Greek word. He says, no one can serve two lords. Either you will ha hate the one and you're going to love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I don't care who you are in this room or if you're listening at home, you cannot serve both God and money. There's something about servitude to both of them that seem to be at the opposite end of the spectrum. And Jesus says you're either going to love one and become uh, serve one and go after one and give your life to one or the other, but he says no one can serve both. So there's, what he's saying is there's no exception to the rule here. And part of our Christian journey is... is 
realising that while the world around me tells me that my provision is my provider, God says to me, no, your provision is not your ultimate provider. Your provision is what I, the provider, have provided to you. So let's get this in perspective here. In other words, don't chase after wealth and riches and money. Chase after God. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you because I'm a good daddy and I know what you need and I'm not going to leave my children in want. I'm not going to leave my children in want. And, and, and so here we have this passage about you can't serve God and money in verse 24. And the very next verse, verse 25, it says, Therefore... What is the therefore, therefore? He's saying basically in light of what I've just said, you can't serve both God and money. You can't do it. You can't be subservient to both. You've got to pick one. You can't be subservient to both. And because of that, I'm telling you, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. See, most of us, if you're a person that worries about your life, it's because you haven't yet got a full revelation that your provider is not your provision. Your provider is your provider who gives you the provision. God. Your Father in heaven is your ultimate provider. And we're to seek first Him. And we're to put God first in everything that we do. We're to put God first. We, 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 this, this is easy because we talk about this in church all year, don't we? You've got to put God first in your marriage. Who's ever heard a message on that? You've got to put God first in your marriage. I love my wife with all my heart, but my wife is not my saviour. Amen? She, she didn't die on a cross for me. I believe she probably would. She loves me that much, she probably would, but she didn't. And if she did, it wouldn't have the same... Oh, she's... Oh, I'm not sure now. She just gave me a funny look. She just gave me one of those, eh, looks. I'm lost. (laughs) I'd die for her, okay? I would do it. But, 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 but here's the thing, if I put Jesus first, I remember having a conversation with a gentleman here, uh, in, in, right there at, at that kitchen sink some years back, and we were talking about, he was, he'd, he'd just, got, just given his life to Jesus not too long ago, him and his wife and his kids and family, and, and, a lot, and they all sort of got saved, and we were chatting at the kitchen there. And, and he said to me, he made the comment to me, he said, oh, I could never ever put God before my family. And so we sat there and we unpacked that and talked a bit about that, and he said, oh, I couldn't, I've got to put my family first. And I tried to say to him, here's the thing, if you put your family before God, you're not going to be able to give your family the best of you. Because what I know from, from my 30-odd years of walking with Jesus and, and from, from uh, going through what these writers in this collection of ancient documents told us about God, their experiences with God, their understanding of God, their encounters with Jesus, the teachings of Jesus and so on, one thing I know is that when we give ourselves first to God, then we tend to have the best of us to give to everything else. I'm a way better husband when I'm, when I'm putting God first than I would ever be if I tried to put my wife first. If I put my wife first, I'm looking through the lens of me and all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I think she wants, what I think she should like and what I think... It's, it, but when I'm looking at God, all of a sudden I'm looking through the lens of, of God, I'm seeing her through the eyes of God, so I'm doing for her what I think is best through the lens of God. How would God... Tr- I'll tell you what, God would treat my wife way better than I ever could on my best day. Because he loves her and he died for her and my children and so on. So we know that we talk about God in your relationships and we talk about God in the workplace. You know, we talk about, you know, be a boss and have integrity and, and lead people and run your business like Jesus, as if Jesus himself was your accountant. As if Jesus himself was the one that was working for you. Treat your employer like that. All that you do, do as unto the Lord. But then we come to this area of finances. And for some reason, some people think it's a little bit different. God, I'll bring you into every other area of my life, but that financial area, well, that's mine. God, that's mine. And I'll give you the best of everything else, but when it comes to finance, I'll just give you what's left if there's anything. Or Once upon a time, the people of God would never have bought to the priest to sacrifice a cow with a broken leg. Don't do it. They just wouldn't do it. Because you gave God the best. You gave God the best. Now we kind of have this culture where, oh, I've got to be brutally honest when it comes to, 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 to giving. When I talk about giving and generosity, I'm not just talking about finances, okay? Generosity and giving is way beyond just finance. But it just so happens that you joined us on a week where we're talking about finances, all right? But giving and generosity is way, way more than that. And it's almost like we have a culture now where two really negative things have collided. Number one is we have a distrust of authority, 
And, and let's face it, that, that is rampant in our culture and our society. We don't trust politicians. We don't trust school teachers anymore. We don't trust policemen. We don't trust this. We don't trust the doctors anymore. We all think what someone said on TikTok, who's you know, studied for three minutes med medicine, is, knows more than... There's a distrust for authority figures these days, and that has seeped into the church too, where we actually don't have a lot of trust for church leaders and pastors and, 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 denom and so on. And so, 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 so what weeds me out is this, that we'll come and we'll sit in a church, we'll give our time, we'll give our bodies, we'll, we'll maybe go on a roster and give this, this, but when it comes to money, people don't want to give anymore in the direction of local churches. People don't want to give anymore. And it's not just about the giving, it's not just about... Uh, uh, it, 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 here's the thing, if, if, if people give to a... Well, I can't speak for every church, to be honest, because uh, uh, I know an accountant who works with different churches in different parts of the country, and sometimes they'll ring me up, and it's the weirdest things they will tell me about those, just to get my opinion, being a pastor while they're, you know, do you, uh, at the end of the year, do you get a 10% bonus if you raise this much money? I know it sounds weird, doesn't it? But it's true, there are churches out there doing that sort of stuff. Let me be very clear. I don't get a cent more if people give more into the life of a rise. I don't get uh, more money. I'm not looking for more money. I'm not doing it for that reason. Uh, but what I'm doing is there's something really important and really pivotal about us breaking the power of the love of money over our lives and being free to pursue Jesus regardless of what that costs us. Regardless. Going hard after God and trusting God and, and putting... See, money is a beautiful thing. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And, and what I think God wants to do is he wants to break off our lives, the love of money. I don't believe for a second that God wants us to be poor with a, you know, the old expression, the backside out of your pants and eating bread and dripping. I don't see that. I, I, from Genesis right through, I read about uh, the character and the nature of my heavenly father and I seem to see that, that there's this correlation all the way through. God says, here, I want you to live this certain way because if you live this certain way... Uh, for some reason, somehow, if you live this way, there's this, this, this it's, it's like getting a, 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 a DVD player. They have still DVDs? You don't really have them now, do you? What's the latest technology thing? Who's, throw a tech, latest iPhone. It's like getting the latest iPhone, okay? And what a lot of us do, we get the latest iPhone, and all we do is we just do with the latest iPhone the same things we did with the first iPhone because we can't be bothered reading the manual because if we read the manual and learnt how to use it properly and did the things it said, we would find way more benefits in that phone and be able to do and achieve so many more things, but we don't want it. We just take, well, this is what I used to think about how I used a phone, so I'm just going to use the new one exactly the same, and we're missing out on so much stuff. And when it comes to money, that's what a lot of people do. This is, this is how I thought about money. This was my relationship to money before I gave my life to Jesus. And now I've come across to Jesus. I, I don't read the manual. I, I just come across and keep the same mindset and the same mentality and the same type of relationship with money that I had before. And one of the things that we see right throughout Scripture is that, that, that God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are actually higher than your ways. They're not different. Don't kid yourself and just think God's ways are different. They're not different. He says they're higher. If they're different, then you can go, eh, pick or choose, six or one, half a dozen of another. They're just different. But God makes it clear they're not different. That's higher. I'm calling you to a higher place and a higher way to live because, hey, I created this thing called human existence and I molded you and I fashioned you in your mother's womb. I put you together. I know how this thing called life works better than anybody else out there because I'm the instigator of it. I'm the giver of life. And if we would line ourselves up with the way that... I mean, the, the, the kingdom of, the, of God is somewhat backwards, isn't it, to the world? You know? It's like you... you, 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 you he, he said, God says, give and, and you receive. God, God says, uh, you know, when somebody hurts you, uh, don't go after them, you, you, you forgive. Like there's all these backwards things in the kingdom that are so different to the world that we're brought up in and the culture that we live in. And God says to us, but I, if you would do it my way, there's just an inherent blessing in obeying me. And that inherent blessing is not necessarily financial. Jesus said, Luke 16, we looked at it last week. Why would we want to give to God and then sit back and go, I'm only going to give God if you give me back material wealth. Well, that tells me straight away, you still think, you know, we don't get it. We still think that material wealth is the most important thing. Jesus said it's the least of riches. It's a training ground. I'm looking at how my people handle their material wealth. Because depending on how you handle it, if I can trust you with that to put me at the centre, 
to, to budget properly, to live within your means, to prioritize first the kingdom. If I can trust you with that, he says, what I'm going to do is pour out upon you real riches, true riches. And I want to go after the true riches. But I know, I know that in most cases, if I was to stand here and say, here's my ironclad promise. The Holy Spirit spoke to me last night and told me to tell you, if you would just give $100 today, he will give you $1,000 back. For every 100 you give, he's going to give you 1000 You know what? A lot of people, if I was 100% convinced and that was going to, you know what? A lot of us would put it, go, yes, you'd give more than 100 You'd give a thousand, and within ten, seven days, you got ten thousand or whatever it is. We wouldn't hesitate if we knew that the blessing bouncing back our way was going to be money. We wouldn't hesitate to be generous, would we? It's because we don't get it still. We don't understand that Jesus said, this, this, this material world, this, this stuff you've got, it's a training ground. How you manage and steward this, it's a training ground. It's not true riches. It's not true riches. But if we can't manage that and steward that and bring God into that space, he says, well, how can I ever trust you with true riches? And I wonder sometimes when I read the book of Acts, and this is what sort of brought us to this. We've been going back and looking at the book of Acts and, 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 and we, we've had this series of redigging wells. What were some of the places that the early church went to? The wells they drank from. Because they drank from somewhere that gave them something that flowed out of them. And the early church in the book of Acts, the history, the first 30 years of the church, written by Luke, we call it this book of Acts, this ancient document, speaks to us about a group of people that were so passionate for God and put the kingdom of God first in all areas. And, and, and as a result of that, I see a whole bunch of things flowing out of that community of faith, that bunch of people. And I don't know where you stand on this, but I do see the healing power of Jesus flowing out of his people. I do believe that signs, wonders and miracles can still happen today. I believe that with all my heart. I still believe that just as there is, God is down here and God is doing his work, I still believe that there is a real entity called the devil. God and the devil are not fighting each other. Okay, God's not even that worried about the devil. He's, he's that far above uh, the devil and so on. It's not even like people go, oh, they're, it's just this, they're at war with each other. Don't give the devil that much due. Like he's a created being. God is uncreated. Uh, God goes like this and it's all over, you know? But there is a demonic realm out there and I do believe that people are being bound by some of this stuff. And I go, God, I want the true riches of, of, of walking in that authority and being able to break that stuff off people's lives. I want the true riches of wisdom to be able to sit down with a a, a couple that are struggling in their marriage and be able to discern what are the real issues and how can we help you in that. That to me is real riches. I'll take that over a million dollars any day. I want to be able to walk up to somebody that's struggling physically that might have cancer or something like that and be able to lay hands on them and say in the name of Jesus, not me, it's not me, it's him, in Jesus' name by the power of God be healed and I want to see people healed and set free of that. That's true riches. I'll take that over a million dollars any day of my life. I want to be able to sit down and open my mouth and begin to talk to people about the death, the burial and the resurrection of Christ and not have it go in one ear and out the other. You ever have those experiences? You just feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall. Yet somehow when these guys spoke, there seemed to be this authority, this power, this conviction, and, and people came to faith. They came to faith. There was something about the words that came. They said of Jesus, this man speaks with authority. I look at that and I go, God, that's true riches. To be able to talk to the world about the goodness of God, the, the cross, the death, and, and be able to, to get a response, not just speak the word of God and have it, people just go boom, boom. I want to be able to stand up here and preach and, and know that it's hitting mark and know that the Holy Spirit is doing things in people's lives and not just going thunk off the forehead, thunk, thunk, thunk. I, I, want, I want to be a part of a community that are chasing hard after Jesus, then are not just saying put, seek first the kingdom, but are actually seeking first the kingdom in every area of our lives, going hard after him. That's what I want. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. He says, I'll tell you, don't worry about your life. He says what you'll eat or about your body, what you'll wear. And then he asks two questions. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Isn't life more than just food and clothes and nice cars and houses and and holidays by the beach? None of those things are bad, by the way. 
Lord, if I can have them, give them to me. I want them. (laughs) You know, some of them I need. But is that all that life consists of? Is that it? Is it just, let's go through life and he who gets the most toys wins? With no thought to eternity. And not just my own eternity. See, I've made the decision to follow Jesus. I've made the decision to follow Jesus. So I'm very confident when, 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 when my spirit departs from this tent, this body of mine, this Adonis-like body, sculptured thing, it's like more like a clay mound thing, you know. When my spirit departs from this, I'm confident where I'm going. I'm going to go and be with Jesus. I don't think I'm going to miss my pool in my backyard. I don't think I'm going to miss uh, the, the car I drive. I don't think I'm going to miss whatever's in my bank account at that point. I don't think I'm going to miss the fact that I don't get to play touch footy on a Wednesday night. I don't think I'm going to miss all that stuff. I think I'm going to be so enamoured with the reality and, and, and I'll probably get a bit more perspective and go, wow, so, so this stuff was fair to him. It re- and I'm probably going to go, why was I so worried about that? Why did I spend so much time doing that? I could have done this. Why was I so obsessed heading in that direction when I could have gone in this direction? Why did I prioritise this instead of that? Why did I bump up the shareholders' pockets of McDonald's so much when I could have given to my church and invested in the kingdom of God and the ministry that's coming out of that place in the local schools and missionaries and children supported and all the stuff that flows out of the life of a church? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Then he says the second question. He says, look at the birds. They don't sow, reap, store in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? What a beautiful, what a... I can just imagine sitting there and having Jesus put that question to the crowds. In other words, what do you think your heavenly Father thinks of you? I'd be sitting there going, well, dude, if he could really see what was in my heart, (laughs) I wouldn't give myself 10 minutes. If he saw what I could see, if he knew what I knew. What an arrogant statement. You think you know things about yourself God doesn't know? You think you see things in your own heart that the Father can't see? Yeah, Jesus is standing there going, I know all the stuff you're probably thinking, but I'm going to say this to you. Are you not more valuable than the birds of the air, the grass of the field? Do you get it? Father loves us. Our Heavenly Father loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die on a cross for us. Not because we're great, not because we've, we've, we've worked. We, we get on that, that religious hamster wheel, you know, where we, it's more and more religious things to try to make God like us. It's never really about making God like us. It's about our own conscience accepting that God likes us. Because our unconscious puts his blocks and, and convinces us otherwise. So we're trying to prove something to our own conscience. I better read more Bible. I better pray more prayers. I better... And nothing, look, and read your Bible. I'm saying you should read it. But, but, but I'm not doing that stuff to get the love of the Father. I'm doing it out of a loving response of the love I already have. Because he loves me, I want to read the word of God. Because he loves me, I want to pray. Because he loves me, I want to gather with his people and I want to worship him. Because he loves me, I'm not doing it to get him to love me. I'm doing it because I know I'm convinced in my heart that he loves me. I don't understand it because if I was him, I'd have questions about loving a guy like me. And you'd probably have questions about loving a person like you. But Jesus throws the question at them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And see, if you answer no to those two questions, no, no, life, uh, food and, and, and the body, this is all that life is about and I'm not more valuable than them, then you are going to set yourself up for a life of worry. And if you set yourself up for a life of worry, you will spend your days chasing more and more provision instead of chasing after the provider. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to chase provision? How many people we know, we're living in a burnout culture as we speak. People are just chasing the almighty dollar. 
another job. I've got to work five jobs. I'm going to chase. I'm going to jump from there to there. I'm going to put myself under more and more stress, but it's worth it because it's more and more money. I'm going to have less and less time with my family, but it's okay, guys. We're going to have more money. And one day, it starts to catch up with us. We won't see each other apart. We were just up in Brisbane last night. A a friend of mine, uh, his wife, a guy I went to school with, his wife turned 50. So we went up last night. We got back at 1.30 this morning. Raced back, landed back here. 1.30. So if I look like my eyes like, eh. We got back nice and early. But I was having a chat with him. He's just been offered this amazing job, absolutely amazing job. They're going to fly him to Sweden. To, to, he's an electrician by trade, auto electrician. And they're looking, the mining companies are looking at going to a battery power uh, to run the mines instead of coal and all this other stuff. And they've asked him to, to basically head up, go to Sweden, get trained and run all the crews and teams around Australia. But he's, he's, he's just recently gotten married a few years ago to a lovely lady and his, his, his kids have got grandkids. His kids have got kids, which are his grandkids now. And you know what? It was so lovely to sit down with a guy and have him go, you know what? I could go after that and we would be set up financially for the rest of our days. But he's not a believer. He's not a Christian. But he said, but if I do that, I've got less time with my wife and I won't get to see my grandkids and I won't get this and... He's talking about these relationships and how important they were to him. They were more important to him than money. So he's not going to take that job, even though he could set himself up. And I think, man, what a, what a, what a great, even though you don't know Jesus, I'm so happy for you that you would make that decision, that perspective. If we worry about our life, we will chase after provision. And here's the thing, enough is never enough because we don't, most people don't even know what enough is. Amen. If I was to sit you down and say, do you know exactly how much you need to just live the kind of life that you think God wants for you? Most people have never even thought about what... They they say, I need more. But most people don't even know what they need in the first place. It's this assumption that I just never have enough and so I just keep needing more, more, more. And we chase after material wealth and material possessions. And we neglect first the seeking of God, who is our ultimate provider. I believe that God has thousands and thousands of testimonies stored up for his people. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to go after him. He wants to do little miracles and things for us. Just like me, the very beginning of my walk with God, I've never forgot those two things. And there were way more where that came from, not just with money, but with a whole range of other things. But one of the first things God taught me when I first came to faith was, Alan, you can actually trust me because you are more valuable than all these other things. You can trust me. And if you put me first, if you put me first, the stuff I have for you, the, the life I have for you, the, the blessings that flow into your world, and, I'm not, and, and forget money. Yes, God has looked after me uh, uh, financially. I've, I've never gone without uh, food and, and all. Like, you know, we're, we're certainly not loaded. Um, and that's okay, you know. It, life is more than that. But I learned to trust him. And I have these amazing testimonies now that, that, that I carry with me through the rest of my days. But I see so many people that that can't relate to that because I know that you've never learned to trust God in that financial realm. I think that's one of the the, the reasons why God encourages his people to give. And I don't want to, if you weren't here last week, go back on YouTube and I don't want to cover all that ground again. But I do believe that God is a good God and I do believe that God calls his people to be generous and to be givers and that all of us have something to contribute to the work of God and what God is doing. I want to finish up here. And for those of you that uh, come along, I had so much more there that I wanted to talk about, but oh, good morning, got, got away from us. Oh, I just want to share a cartoon and I want to finish with this. Um, this is something that I came across ages ago in an old peanut. Who likes peanuts? Came across it in an old Peanuts thing. Now, if you're a member of Arise, I'm kind of going to speak to you. If you're not a member of Arise, uh, then, then, then I'm not necessarily talking to you. If, you, if This is not where you go. If, if you're attending here today from another uh, uh, gathering, another church you're a part of, I'm encouraging you, be generous in your church. Be generous with your time, be generous in your service, be generous in your attitude, be generous in your compliments and your encouragement. But I'm also going to encourage you, be generous with your finances too. Be generous with your finances. When God built the temple, way back in the Old Testament, the minute he built that thing, gave them all the materials to put together, what do you think happened the minute they built it? I can tell you what happened. Every piece of that thing started to deteriorate, rot, fall apart, and so on. It's just the natural cycle of life. God didn't come down every day and miraculously make everything freshen up. Okay? 
there was this thing called the tithes that they used to give, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm bringing that to, but I'm just saying, call it whatever you want, they gave. Each person gave to the temple. And what was it used for? It was used for the upkeep of the temple, the payment of those that ministered in the temple, and the ministry that came out of the temple. That's what it was. And it's no different today. So if you're here from another church, I'm encouraging you. I hope you are financially contributing to the church that you go to when you're giving and a part of the bigger picture. And so I want to finish with this cartoon, a I, 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 uh, comic strip that I read. It's an old Peanuts cartoon. Lucy is demanding that her brother Linus change TV channels. And then she threatens him with her fists like this if he doesn't. Anyone got little sisters? Yeah? Zaspi, you know what I'm talking about. The, I've seen your sister do kung fu on you. You're like that. Okay? She threatens him with a fist like this if he doesn't change the channels. What makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? Asks Linus. These five fingers, said Lucy. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. <laughs> what channel do you want, side Linus? <laughs> Turning away, he looked at his fingers and he said, why can't you guys get organised like that? <laughs> and I want to leave you with this challenge. Imagine what we could do as a gathering, as a congregation here, if we got a revelation of the power of generosity, if each of us contributed something, if each of us gave, disclaimer again, I am not getting a pay rise, I'm not after that. But there's so much more that we want to do in this community. There's so much more that we would love to be able to do uh, through the life of Arise. Needs that we'd love to meet. Missionaries we'd love to be involved in supporting. We would love to get a youth pastor in here to work with the kids that are starting to come through. We would, there's so much. We would love to. One day we're going to have to probably end up getting a, 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 moving into some facility that's a bit bigger. One day it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And so, so I want to encourage you, look, individually, yeah, you might not feel like you can do a lot. I don't feel like I can do a lot. But together, we can become a weapon that is scary to behold to the kingdom of darkness in this place. Amen? Amen. Bless you guys. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, and, and, and Lord, I thank you for, God, just the way the morning has gone, Lord. It's great when it doesn't go exactly according to plan. And so, Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, God, that you love us with an everlasting love. Father, I thank you that you have good plans and you have good purposes in store for your people. And I pray, Holy Spirit, uh, those of us here, if there are areas of our life where we are not seeking first the kingdom, areas where we're not putting you first, God, Father, I pray, just gently speak to us and nudge us in the right direction, Father that, God, we can get fully involved in what it is that you're doing, not just in our lives, but in this generation, in this particular place where you have put us right now, Father. We want to see people hear this wonderful story of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We want people to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them, not just a philosophy about a religious guy, but a very real, active, and vibrant God that wants to get involved in their world today. So, Father, we thank you for that, Lord. And I pray in the next seven days as we leave this place, each one of us here that know you, God, give us a chance to talk to somebody out there about the goodness of God. There's going to be somebody who comes across our path this week that doesn't know about you. Give us the courage and the boldness, the courage and the boldness to step into that opportunity when it comes and to share the goodness of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.